Good evening, and welcome to the American Antiquarian Society's public program, Poor Richard's Women, with Nancy Rubin Stewart. We come to you from the ancestral homelands of the Nipmuc tribal community, who remain an active presence here in central Massachusetts. I'm Scott Casper, president of the American Antiquarian Society. We have some newcomers here this evening, so I'll say a few words of introduction to AAS, a national research library located in Worcester, Massachusetts. We collect, preserve, and share materials printed or produced before 1900 in what is now the United States, portions of Canada, and the Caribbean. Our collections include books and pamphlets, newspapers and periodicals, manuscripts, and the graphic arts. AAS supports and welcomes scholars and readers from around the country and indeed around the world to use our reading room or to seek out digitized materials on our website. We also offer regular programming like tonight's virtual program. I invite you to join us for upcoming program in the coming weeks and months. This evening's program is the second in a series that we are calling Women Make History, focusing on women's history and authors, and we hope you'll return to see others in this series. You can go to our website for continual updates, including other series related to nature and the environment, artists in the archive, history of the book, and perspectives from the collections, programs that consider one object in our collections from multiple areas of expertise. We thank you for joining us this evening, and as a nonprofit organization, we welcome any support you can provide to help keep this work going. Thank you. Now I'm happy to introduce my colleague, Amanda Kondek, to provide a quick overview on the platform we're using for tonight's program. Amanda? Thank you, Scott, and good evening, everyone. Closed captioning is available for tonight's program via Zoom's live transcription. You can turn the closed captioning on and off with the button labeled CC located at the bottom of your Zoom screen. During the program, I'll be posting relevant links and information in the chat. If you would like to save the chat to have the links for a later use, you can save a transcription by opening the chat window and clicking on the three dots in the bottom right corner. If you have any problems with your visual or audio settings, you can also message me in the chat. During our Q&A session tonight, um, if you have any questions for our speakers, please type them in there. The Q&A also has an upvote option. So if someone posts something you would like to see discussed, be sure to upvote it by clicking on the thumbs up icon. You can place your questions into the Q&A function at any point during the program. And finally, we are recording this program and we'll make it available on our website and our YouTube channel. So thank you, Scott. Thanks so much, Amanda. And now it's a pleasure to introduce Nancy Rubin Stewart, who is no stranger to the American Antiquarian Society, having been a Hearst Creative Artists and Writers Fellow here in 2005. She's an award-winning author and journalist whose eight nonfiction books focus on women and social history. While she was here at the Antiquarian Society in 2005, she worked on The Muse of the Revolution, The Secret Pen of Mercy Otis Warren and the Founding of a Nation, which was published in 2008. She followed that with Defiant Brides, the untold story of two revolutionary era women and the radical men they married. She's also written books on the 19th century spiritualist Maggie Fox and the 20th century heiress Marjorie Merriweather Post. Nancy previously wrote for the New York Times, for the A&E network series, America's Castles and HGTV's Restore America, and for a variety of newspapers and periodicals. She's also the executive director of the Cape Cod Writers Center. Last week, Nancy Rubin Stewart's new book, Poor Richard's Women, Deborah Reed Franklin and the Other Women Behind the Founding Father appeared from Beacon Press, and she's joined us tonight to talk about this fascinating story. Nancy, welcome. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here, Scott. Really, it's, um, <laughs> it's wonderful after a lot of, lot of work. Um, you know, I began this book uh, with questions uh, about Deborah Reed and about Ben Franklin. Uh, and what I learned was uh, more than I had expected. Um, I'll just uh, say that Ben Franklin uh, found that he, he admired women, he loved them, uh, but he found his attraction to them as shocking and dangerous as electricity itself. So uh, 
I think we'll begin the slide presentation now and I will um, tell you a little bit more um, about the book. So we can go to Ben Franklin, I'm sure you all know, we can go to the next slide. You all know about him and electricity and the kite, and of course the signing of the Declaration of the Independence and, and many, many things that he did, uh, including um, secure uh, finances to help support the revolution from France. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and you must know about the Almanac, of course, which is what most people think about as him as the icon of practicality with these sayings all too familiar to us. Um, just a few of the many, many years of the Almanac. Next slide, please. And now, of course, as we've known for a long time, he is the icon of reason and logic and thrift. Um, and he's, he's considered, you know, the arch rationalist, as, as one reviewer said, uh, about the book and uh, somebody who uh, never gave in to passions and indulge, indulged himself. Next slide, please. Uh, he actually began with his admiration for women as early as, as during adolescence when he wrote uh, anonymously in his brother's, his, uh, his brother's uh, newspaper, the New England Courant, uh, and he wrote about, of all things, he, he took the name, we'd love to take women's names, silence, do good, and she made all kinds of comments about society, Puritan society. And uh, here is just a little scrap of one. My favorite, though, is when he talks about the prostitutes or night walkers and what a wonderful boon they were to the, uh, to the Boston economy. Uh, next slide, please. Well, of course, he fled from his brother's newspaper. He'd been an apprentice printer apprentice. He hated uh, being beaten by his brother when he wasn't obedient. And he, he fled to Philadelphia. And for a while he worked for a printer. And, uh, but the first time that Deborah saw him uh, in 1723, he was a runaway. He was dirty. He had been on the road for a couple of, couple of weeks and uh, he was starving. And he, she saw him walking by her house near Market, Play, Market, Play, Market Street. And he had two rolls under one arm and he was ravenously eating the other one and she left. Well, let's fast forward a few months and suddenly he's back uh, in, in front of her house and he's now talking to her father, John Reed, the carpenter, and he's asking to rent a room. And she's astonished. Now she thinks this is the same man, but he's well-kept. He's uh, well-spoken, he's dressed well. Of course, he says his trunk and his clothes and all of that had arrived, he had a job. And pretty soon he was renting a room from John Reed, her father. And uh, he does admit that as time went on, he made some courtship to Miss Reed. Now, Deborah, uh, Deborah uh, was, uh, this is a picture taken, uh, a portrait painted much later uh, in her life, um, but she could see that she was reasonably attractive. One thing that, that Ben certainly noted was she was a middle-class daughter of a car fairly well-to-do carpenter. And so indeed there must've been a dowry. That's all well and good. Now, in the uh, fall of 1724, uh, Ben was about to depart to England uh, because he was going to buy printing equipment, supposedly um, <laughs> at the favor of and the funding of uh, the governor of, of the colony of Pennsylvania. Well, it turned out the governor was a bit of a scam, but in any case, he was ready to go. John Reed died uh, oh, about a month or two before uh, ben was to depart, and uh, Mrs. Reed then said to the young couple, she didn't think this was a good time for them to think about getting married, that Ben was going to be away for a while, and besides, they were very young. Well, Deborah was heartbroken. I should say Mrs. Reed had already a, a pretty thriving ointment and salve business, and Deborah undoubtedly learned her bookkeeping skills uh, from her mother, must have assisted her. Um, so uh, Deborah was, was uh, promised Ben she would remain faithful to him and he to her, and he went to England. But soon after he was there, he wrote her back and said he didn't know when he would be back really with ever. Well, she was heartbroken. And within a few months, she was accepting um, really suitors. Uh, one of them was a man named John Rogers. He was a potter from England. And in August of 1725, she married him. Uh, all well and good. Only problem was that she soon found out he was married. He had a wife in England and a child. That ended the marriage for her. Uh, heartbroken, she fled back to her mother uh, and she was dejected because she was neither single nor married. John Reed had taken her dowry, of course. He'd squandered it. He'd fallen into debt. And eventually he fled to uh, the West Indies, we think Barbados. And then the rumors began that he had been killed, but there was no way to prove it. So divorces were very difficult to obtain in colonial Philadelphia. 
Uh, she couldn't get, there was no way to prove anything. So again, she was, she was a strange situation. Her friends were getting married and having babies. She was still technically married. Uh, and it was a, a pretty bad situation. Well, Ben, meanwhile, came back about a year later from England and found her a different person. She was no longer lively and spirited and sociable and laughing. She was quite depressed. Nevertheless, Ben went on, uh, went back and finally worked for the printer again, a printer named Keemer. Uh, and then he eventually started his own, co-founded a print shop of his own. In the meanwhile, he courted other women. Well, the fathers didn't want anything to do with having him marry their daughters because printers were considered poor providers. So in the summer of 1730, he already had his print shop. His partner had already departed, so it was only his. He, uh, and he had been somewhat friendly with, uh, with Mrs. Reed before that, probably giving her financial advice because his print shop was already beginning to, to look more profitable. He approached Mrs. Reed and he, he explained his guilt. He confessed his guilt. And she, she said she blamed herself too because she'd encouraged Deborah to marry uh, when, he was, when he was in England. So ultimately, um, I guess Deborah must have been overjoyed, but uh, and now they couldn't get married. <laughs> And there were debts that, that her former husband had, so they would be technically responsible for them if, if, uh, if anything could be proven. In any case, what he wrote in his autobiography, and Ben had a way of kind of glossing over the important emotional highlights in his life. He wrote, I took her to wife on September 1st, 1730. It was a common law marriage. Uh, now, common law marriages were not that unusual. I mean, it was better to be married in a church but that wasn't obviously possible. And so at first that seemed like everybody accepted it, although some people raised their eyebrows. Well, Deborah and seemed to be very happy um, with Ben. He even wrote six weeks into their marriage as a newlywed rules and maxims for promoting matrimonial happiness. <clears throat> well, the bottom line message was that women should obey their husbands. I have to tell you that didn't last very long because much later, some 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 months later, he he wrote another one about the virtues of a scolding wife. And indeed, Deborah had sort of this prickly side. Uh, one neighbor called her a hedgehog who used to shoot uh, quills at at her when she was angry. And other people have reported on her her you know her sort of uh, ability to um, let somebody uh, know what she thought of them on no uncertain terms. But she was very capable. Uh, terrific bookkeeper. When they married, she immediately took his stationery shop and she converted it into a very profitable dry goods store. She imported goods from the wharves on the Delaware and from the countryside, and it became a bustling business. And she even assisted Ben, uh, certainly financially, because he talks about that later. Uh, and all seemed to be pretty, pretty good for the first few months of their marriage. And then in the winter of 1731, one day, he arrived home with a squirming bundle and within it was a little baby boy. Now, Ben did admit in his autobiography, which, which by the way, I found pretty amazing that he'd, he'd write this in his autobiography, that he had cohabited with low women for quite a while to satisfy his natural instincts. Uh, but this child was obviously his, his love child or out of wedlock child. Uh, and Deborah, uh, who was about around 20 years of age, was absolutely stunned. She certainly, as a newlywed, she didn't want to take care of someone else's child. Where was the mother? Well, we don't know. But what we, one of the many theories that historians have offered was that uh, this, whoever the child's mother was, she must have been somebody who wasn't just a low woman, a prostitute. She was probably somebody he knew whose husband was away or at sea. Uh, because he, he claimed paternity. If the woman had been a prostitute, there was no need for him to claim paternity, but he did uh, with this child. The child's name was William. Uh, we can go to the next slide, please. And uh, he, we can then go to the next slide after that. William eventually grows up to become the governor of New Jersey and a barrister. Uh, can we just forward to the next slide, please? Oh, I'm sorry, we need to go back one more. Sorry, back to William. Well, so uh, a, a few years later, uh, Deborah finally does have a child of her own, a little boy. 
and his name uh, is Frankie. Uh, well, that's what they called him, his nickname. And they and Deborah and Ben adored him. They even had a portrait painted of him. He was under the age of four. He was even being tutored, they said, by, before he was three years of age. Uh, and he was sort of the apple of their eye. Now, Ben in his Pennsylvania Gazette always was warning the public. And he was very public-minded and very concerned about the civic well-being and he was determined to make Pennsylvania the leading city in the colonies. And so when smallpox uh, epidemics began in Boston, he immediately in the Pennsylvania Gazette warned people and he begged them to please get inoculated. Now, it wasn't with a hypodermic needle in those days. It was a much more primitive method, uh, basically, of scraping something from the sore of somebody with smallpox into the arm or the trunk of somebody who didn't have it. Most people survived. Nevertheless, the rumors prevailed. Sounds familiar today, yes. Um, but, uh, and he, again, smallpox came back several times. He kept writing about people, please begging them to please be inoculated. Now his three-year-old son, almost four, he wanted to have inoculated, but he couldn't because little Frankie was ill with dysentery, a terrible uh, and often life-threatening disease. He did not inoculate him and the child soon died. So this remained a heartache for Ben and for Deborah. Deborah, uh, we don't know much about Deborah's early emotional life because Ben hasn't recorded it and, and it has not been recorded uh, in, her, in any, any form until much later in, in, in her life. But in any case, she had a prominent, uh, she had a picture of little Frankie, that portrait prominently displayed uh, in her home for the rest of her life. Now, Ben was politically very active. And as I say, he was socially uh, pledged to, to, to the social good. He did many things. I will not take a lot of time to enumerate them, but just briefly, he began a library, a lending library. He had formed a tradesman's club called the, the first it was called the Leather Apron, then it became known as the Junto, which were not just tradesmen, but up and coming young men who really eventually uh, became among the most powerful uh, and you know, intellectually important people in Philadelphia. Um, he wanted to have the streets uh, paved. Uh, he pushed for lighting on the streets. He um, began a, what, an academy, uh, and he, uh, which would become the University of Pennsylvania. Um, there's so many things that he did, it's, it's hard to recall. I also have to say at the same time, uh, starting in, uh, in the late 1730s, he was appointed the postmaster of Philadelphia. That gave him a huge advantage uh, because he then was able to read everything from other places, uh, other newspapers, other postal, and he, um, was already interested in and keeping records like a scientist. He was a natural scientist and he was observing natural phenomena. Now he had newspapers uh, that would also share, including uh, some reports from England. He'd be the first person to see them in Philadelphia. And that was powerful. He also became the clerk of the assembly. So he was immediately involved in the inner workings of uh, the government of uh, the colony of, of Pennsylvania. Uh, and uh, eventually he, um, his, his printing establishment spreads out. He has other, he owns paper mills. Uh, he has people working for him. He has, well, imitators or little gazettes in, others, in other cities. In short, he becomes a media mogul of the day. And so, uh, but meanwhile, Deborah's working by his side. She's, uh, and he, he does praise her. He says he was lucky enough to have a wife uh, who was frugal and who was therefore a fortune to him. And he gives her a great deal of credit for that. He doesn't wax eloquently on it, but he certainly mentions it. Uh, and he, there's also a famous song that he, he once presented to the Masons, another group he started in Philadelphia, uh, in, called My Plain, I Sing My Plain Country Jane. And, and he agrees that he, she's not, maybe not, not gorgeous, but she's been thrifty and devoted and, and she's really lifted his burden and she's uh, helped him enormously with his, uh, with his amassing of fortune. So in short, by the 1740s, he's a very wealthy man and he uh, starts um, thinking about electricity. He's gone and seen some, some, some uh, 
well, exhibits of electric, electric phenomenon. He's curious. Uh, Deborah finally has a second child, De- uh, Sally. Uh, and uh, Deborah, more than, than Ben, really dotes on her. Uh, ben is more concerned with her moral good and, and teaching her and also training her to be a colonial wife. But meanwhile, he's very involved in electricity. And as you know, in the late 1740s and early 1750s, he achieves international claim uh, for his discoveries about electricity and the lightning rod. Uh, But while he's at the same time now, he's been appointed the colonial uh, postmaster of, of, he's the postmaster of all the colonies uh, in the America. And uh, that leads him to make many, many tours uh, south and north of Philadelphia to improve the post offices. And he does things like uh, gets starts a dead letter office. He has uh, express riders. He has overnight delivery uh, and many other innovations, which we don't have time to get into now. Uh, but while on a tour in 1754 in Boston, he meets through his his uh, brother, who he's, he's staying with, uh, a relative by marriage. And her name is Catherine Green. Next slide, please. Catherine is... 23, she's lively, intelligent, highly intelligent, curious. Of course, Ben is internationally known now as this, this, uh, this renowned, he's a renowned scientist and she's fascinated by him and taken by him. And what ensues is, an, is, a, is really quite an infatuation um, between them. Catherine um, comes from Block Island off of uh, Rhode Island. It's a, and she must go back there from Boston and Ben, agrees in the middle of this this sort of enamored relationship to to escort her um, back to the shore in uh, in Rhode Island. And they do go with two other people. One is a Mr. Post, I suppose, a driver, and another is a relative, but the uh, the relative leaves somewhere before their destination. So we don't know what happened. We know they was at least a two-day carriage ride. We don't know what inn they stayed in or how they stayed or whatever. Apparently, Ben volunteered in the middle of this really quite charming and delicious flirtation to teach her multiplication, and she refused. However, the letters that go on between them are very romantic, and the infatuation continues. Here's just one example. You promised to send me kisses in the wind. Um, Your favors come with the snowy fleeces, the snow, which are as pure as your virgin innocence, white as your lovely bosom, and as cold. So... The the uh, the intimacy he wants he he doesn't get. He even writes to her as he returns to Philadelphia. He had almost forgotten he had a home in Philadelphia. That's that's how impassioned he was. But the relationship does evolve into one of he becomes sort of an avuncular figure uh, who advises Catherine on life and on her suitors. Eventually, uh, and that friendship continues. And eventually, she does marry a man who will become the. Uh, the governor of Rhode Island. Next slide, please. As I say, he was very active in the assembly and he was very active uh, politically. He was very disturbed that the Pens uh, wielded that royal charter they had uh, with the colony of Pennsylvania. They almost uh, like despots. Uh, Yes, the assembly had a voice, but the Pens were the ultimate and they refused to pay taxes, uh, particularly important because of the uh, hostilities on the frontier, and that's by the Ohio River uh, Valley and the frontier, and there, there are hostilities, that uh, invasions, and so on, at one point, even invasion into Germantown, which is part of Philadelphia. So uh, the assembly, and he, there's a lot of things he does to, be, to buck that. The assembly finally appoints him um, to go to London and plead with the pens and perhaps take this complaint, this grievance to the crown uh, that the pens should, you know, it shouldn't have the royal charter anymore, that it should become a, a regular colony uh, like most of the other colonies uh, uh, in the American continent. In any case, he arrives in, he, he expects Deborah to go with him and to his shock, she refuses. The historians um, have offered many different theories uh, one is that, of course, Deborah had come over as a very young child from Birmingham, England. <clears throat> Journeys in the early 18th century were treacherous. Uh, often they were, uh, you know, very difficult. So there were shipwrecks. Uh, there were pirates. There were storms. There were uh, disease. Uh, a lot of, you know, awful, awful times. 
And uh, she must have, she and Wendy came with her parents, perhaps she experienced that. That's one theory that therefore she refused. Other theories are uh, that she, um, she was more comfortable in Philadelphia. There's a really misogynist theory that she was so stupid uh, and so provincial that she was ashamed to go to England because she would be no match for the sophisticated women uh, who lived in London. In any case, she didn't go. And Ben went by himself, uh, taking his son, William, by then a grown young man to study law. Uh, he moved into a townhouse, what is now 36 Craven Street. It's in central London. Uh, it's become a museum. It's known today as the Benjamin Franklin House. And he lived with a widow, middle-class widow, whose husband had died and left her the townhouse. And she rented out part of it to lodgers. So that's why he had rented a series of rooms. At first, he talks about her. He barely mentions her to Deborah, although we do know that right away, uh, within a matter of a few weeks, he was ill and she took care of him. She nursed him back to health. Then she advised him on his clothes, proper British clothes. She introduced him to friends. They attended many events together, concerts and lectures and, and uh, entertained as a couple. And most people began to think of them as a couple. No questions asked, I guess, in the, the British discreet manner. One of, one of the, his friends writes an alarming letter to, to Deborah and says, please come over here and protect your interests. He's very popular among the ladies. Um, but Deborah refuses. Uh, we don't know a lot about Mrs. Stevenson. Much of what we know is through Ben's letters. Uh, next slide, please. Um, I just want to come back to Deborah's correspondence again. The, the historians in the past have, have sort of either neglected her, marginalized her, or uh, accused her of being a ignorant, provincial, stupid woman, nowhere near the uh, nowhere near what what Ben should have had as a spouse. And one has to understand she didn't know how to read and write and compute, but she did not learn spelling, and that was not that was pretty normal. That middle class women in Philadelphia, anyway, didn't. Spelling wasn't considered important, but you see from some of these letters that are much later um, that she she is uh, pretty pretty careful in terms of her finances and she's financially astute and she actually sells and buys property um, as time goes on. So you'll see some of these. I particularly like the uh, the second one that begins uh, the second sentence of the second one. Amos Strudel has bought them at one third more of these houses that they are worth. Indeed, I wouldn't give half above what he's what he has for them. And of course, I am ever your affectionate wife. They, they continue to write to each other in these affectionate terms. Um, it's, it's kind of remarkable. Um, you know, was this just an agreed upon, um, you know, separation where he went and did whatever he wanted to do? Um, we don't know, uh, but it would seem that way. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, well, Mrs. Stevenson had a daughter, Polly, uh, and this is probably her wedding picture. It's the only image we have. Uh, and ba Polly was a year younger than Sally. And the contrast in his treatment of them is, is remarkable. Sally, he is always lecturing back home about thrift and morality. And <laughs> Polly, he is very much more indulgent with her. Uh, of course, Polly is, is intellectually curious and is plying him with questions. And he writes her long letters with explanations. So uh, it's, it's very different. And, and uh, he really becomes sort of the surrogate father to, to Polly. Uh, and I, I, this, this goes on for quite a while. Well, Ben returns to um, Philadelphia in 1763. He's only there for two years and he's continually writing to people saying he wants to be back in England. He misses it terribly. He writes to Mrs. Stevenson. Uh, and tells, says that he, and he, it's interesting that there's no copy of, of that letter or, or the, but he's sending her presents and it's somehow, Deborah knows about Mrs. Stevenson, but whether she's looking the other way or it's just accepted, I don't know. But in 1765, again, now we have to think this is the beginning of the, uh, the worst of the pre-revolutionary oppression from the government to the British government, all the acts that have gone on and the uh, soldiers are beginning to uh, come and so on, and things are pretty bad. But the assembly, the Pennsylvania assembly, has sent Ben once more to plead with the Pens, 
Um, but things, of course, change. And pretty soon he finds himself really the chief minister negotiating with parliament really over the next 10 years to try to prevent a revolution. Um, and he really is only supposed to be there for a little while as he was the first time, but no, he is there for 10 years. Deborah keeps writing to him. I mean, many letters. We know the first batch were lost. I don't know why, miscarried, lost at sea. Ben didn't keep them or his grandson who takes over his estate later um, was careless about them. We don't know, but we don't have those letters, but we do have them from 1765 to 1773, four, uh, when uh, we now begin to get Deborah's voice. And this is not a, a stupid woman. She's not the intellectual, say, equal of Ben. She's, she's not well-read. Uh, she's not a deep thinker, but she is highly capable. Uh, she's now running many of Ben's, taking care of many of Ben's fina finances. She's really the spokesperson for him with other people keep asking her. She nurses um, many people in the community. Um, she is uh, known by everybody. She had assisted in the post office so much, the colonial post office, that Ben had, when he turned it over to someone before he left, he said, you have to listen to Mrs. Franklin. She knows everything about this post office. And she was very gifted at money exchanges and so on. So Deborah's working hard in uh, the United States, in uh, what were uh, then still colonial America, while Ben is in England. And the, and the presents go back and forth between the man with Mrs. Stevenson and so on. There are, uh, there are cursory notes to each other, polite and respectful and, and regards and sometimes presents. But, uh, and, the, and Ben and, and Deborah keep signing their letters, your affectionate husband, your affectionate wife, and they begin them, my dear child, which I guess is like, like baby or sweetie or something that we might say today. Uh, so it's curious, is this, um, you know, would this be the 18th century uh, version of uh, a legal separation or an amiable kind of a divorce? Well, Deborah keeps begging him to come back. And every year he tells her he's going to come in the spring or he's going to come in the fall. He has to do one thing. Of course, the political situation is, is heating up uh, into a firestorm of controversy and threats of revolution during that time. Uh, Polly does get married. Uh, Sally, his uh, Ben's daughter, is championed by Deborah because Sally wants to marry this impoverished Englishman, and Ben is horrified. But you know, this is Deborah's sort of claim to another claim to independence, where she allows the marriage. So there are soon grandchildren on both sides, and Ben keeps comparing the two, the grandsons on either side, which you know I think was very hurtful to Deborah. Next slide, please. You know, we've heard so much about in the popular, and you'll see it all over the internet, some really incredible rumors about him as a womanizer and a lecherous and all of this. Of course, his enemies made much of that because of his illegitimate son, William. But, you know, where the truth really lies is, is somewhat difficult. Although Charles Wilson Peale, a very young artist from America, uh, was uh, came to London to study art, and he lived, uh, took rooms at uh, Mrs. Stevenson's townhouse, which was quite large. And he knew Ben, of course, well. So one day, uh, he just opened the door to Ben's room, not thinking about it, and, and came across Ben with this lady. And we can go to the next slide after this. And this one, of course, is even more revealing. Uh, we don't know who the lady was, unidentified, but, you know, it does, uh, it gives everyone pause. And, and it sort of adds to the myth of uh, Ben's, you know, a, enormous attraction to women. Um, just how enormous it was is <laughs> highly debatable. And next slide, please. Well, uh, by the time Ben returns to Philadelphia, Deborah, who has been longing for him and writing to him and has been in failing health and finally dies of a stroke, second stroke, uh, and uh, he doesn't get back in time. He's in very, it's his late 74, she dies. And uh, he gets back in April of 1775. Of course, you know, that's just a few days after the uh, bloodshed at Lexington and Concord. Uh, and he does serve in um, all the, well, the new nations and so on, signing the declaration and being involved in 
in the Congress and uh, actually even going to uh, see Washington's army in Boston. But uh, within two years, um, he is sent now to France to plead with them uh, to obtain funds uh, for defense of the American soldiers who are the patriots who are trying to defend themselves against the British. He only spends a short time in Paris. It's too filled with smoke, uh, smoky air, just like it was in London. And he is soon invited um, by an aristocrat to live in the nearby village of Passy. And there he is introduced to this charming uh, musician, very famous. Boccherini wrote his uh, sixth sonata dedicated it to her. She was, uh, she was um, an advocate of the new pianoforte rather than the harpsichord. Now, Madame Brion, was uh, only 33 and Ben is now in his early seventies and he, she is taken with him and he with her and they begin to have a, a romance. She's married, uh, it was an arranged marriage to a much older man and she has two daughters. Uh, but this, the romance um, is, is incredible. It's of course written in French but it's translated much of it and the love letters that pass between them are remarkable, especially hers, because, you know, she says she sits publicly on his lap and, you know, she thinks that's fine, even though people raise their eyebrows and she uh, has regular dates with him. I'll call them dates on uh, Wednesdays and Saturdays for dinners and strolls and concerts. And they make music together and they, and they play chess together with her sometimes in the bathtub. Well, make no mistake, Americans made a big deal of that. But as was pointed out in those days, that was considered de rigueur in France. Uh, she had a plank over her uh, in the bathtub that was considered. In any case, they had this, this romance. He, she pledges eternal love to him. And she's very clever um, and she is highly educated uh, as were the elite women of pre-revolutionary France. Uh, and um, he expects intimacy with her, of course. And she ultimately refuses. Uh, and this is a very unhappy time for him. All the while he's negotiating with France uh, for funds and for more funds uh, with the French court and with Vergen and with uh, other high placed uh, people uh, and going back and forth um, to Versailles and so on. Nevertheless, she expects him to remain faithful to her and not to see other women. And uh, he can't take that. And there's, there's uh, some very sort of touching uh, comments that he makes in some of his letters. And he says that maybe he's at an age where he shouldn't be, you know, with a younger woman, but there's nothing wrong with him admiring women. And he expects to spend time with others. And she is just furious about that. Nevertheless, next slide, please. He soon meets another woman. And this woman was uh, a widow, uh, Madame Helvetius. She was much older. Uh, and she a famous hostess of a salon, a celebrated salon uh, with the leading philosophers and scientists and, and theoreticians and, and so on of the pre-revolutionary France. Uh, she's famous for that. Uh, her husband had uh, left her with a, a lot of money, but she's very unconventional. She's almost a hippie, even though she looks formally dressed here. Uh, she gives away her chateau in, uh, or her whatever it was, townhouse in, in Paris. She buys this estate in a nearby village of um, Otile, and this is where she holds her, her salons. Uh, she has a menagerie that populates her gardens. It's filled with a series of unusual uh, plants and vegetation and trees that friends and so on have brought back or she's, she's awarded uh, from various countries. And she has 18 cats running around in her house. Um, you know, when Abigail Adams meets her some few years later, she's just horrified at the unconventional, casual uh, familiarity with which she addresses Ben and uh, her, her just sort of lack of what, well, New England Abigail would consider proper manners. Nevertheless, she flirts with Ben over and over again, and, and he falls in love with her, and he pursues her violently uh, and persistently for years. And finally, she, she's very independent. She does not want to get married again. Uh, as uh, Turgot, the economist who was a close friend of hers and Ben says, she refused to be a slave to anybody. And ultimately he becomes, Ben becomes so passionate about marrying her that she becomes frightened and she flees to Tours, France. So 
Then, for all of his reason and logic, at least let me say the iconic image of him, we do have to wonder. Please, the next slide. Um, famous statement of his, which again, may or may, may have been folk wisdom that he then adapted with his, his very sharp pen. If passion drives, let reason hold the reins. Well, there is a question. Uh, I believe that uh, beneath this iconic image that, and we see this, you know, politically, we don't, don't really know that much personally about him, uh, at least in the popular mind, that beneath this iconic image uh, burned the heart of, uh, of, a, of a man who really struggled with passion and prudence. Uh, so uh, Ben does eventually, um, finally, uh, after the treaty uh, with England is signed, he does come back to Philadelphia, where he is cared for by Sally. She has eight children by then, he has eight grandchildren. And eventually, Polly, the daughter of the other woman he loved, comes and is cared for him in his last years. Uh, so we can finish with the start slides at this point. Um, and I just want to say it's been uh, really a remarkable journey to have uh, researched and, and written this book. And I learned so much. And I hope you've learned too. Um, and what was most surprising to me was that this iconic image that we all have is only part of the picture. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nancy. This is fascinating. It's a fascinating and an entertaining book. Um, and beyond the pure enjoyment of learning about Benjamin Franklin's relationships, and it is fun reading, what's the hist what do you see as the historical importance of, of the book and its story? Well, again, as I say, I think, uh, Scott, that um, what we know and actually which is being celebrated even now is the brilliance, and nobody's going to take that away, uh, of his uh, a remarkable scientific and inventorial and political accomplishments. I mean, that's a given. He is a remarkable man. At least uh, one biographer said he probably had the best mind in 18th century America, uh, and nobody's going to disagree. He's also incredibly charming and very funny. But to me, uh, I think that um, beyond the entertainment value, let's say, of reading this book, you begin to see a much more dimensionalized person uh, that has, has you know, really not been highlighted. And I have to wonder, I just do, whether this, icon, this image of, of ultimate reason and rationality and, and logic always you know, overpowers heart, that underneath, maybe this is a way to compensate for what was really going on, which was a private struggle of Ben Franklin's. Yeah, wonderful. Um, by the way, our Q, the Q&A is open. So if you'd like to uh, ask questions of Nancy Rubin Stewart, please don't hesitate to put your questions into the q and I'll be following that even as, as I ask a few more questions of my own. You know, this is, this is not just a book about Benjamin Franklin. It's very much a book about the women themselves. And at the same time, and you, you've written several books about women in the, in the 18th century, you, you've certainly come across the imbalance of sources, the fact that the sources, the sources for women's lives and sources from women's pens are so much more fleeting, so much, so much harder to find than those for men. Um, and in Benjamin Franklin's case, of course, so much more has been written and preserved by and about him than about these women in his life. How did you go about elucidating the women's perspective. At various points when you're talking about Deborah, you talk about how she's heartbroken or how she's, you know, how she has certain kinds of feelings, but we don't really have her letters. So how do you, how do you get into her, her mind and her thoughts? Yes, it's a good question. Um, you know, uh, of course, some of it you get by what other people have said um, and said about her so that you begin to know. And you, and some things Ben has written about women, uh, particularly once he's married and he, he loves to be in other women's voices and characters. So you get some of that. He has, some of that had to be personal. For instance, he talks about the furnace that he invented. And he talks about how women, especially women in middle age, were getting wrinkles and sick all the time. And, uh, you, you know, and now Deborah is, is, you know, getting towards 40, which in those days was, was middle age. And, you, you know, you begin to divine from those kinds of things um, more about Deborah. Um, and after all, she didn't have a child for seven years. 
Uh, but, but then fortunately, we start to get her letters from 1765 on. Unfortunately, there's only nine years of them. Um, there are a few little letters before that. It is true. There's a few where she writes to an English printer to please her master. Her master, quotes, unquote, had asked her to get books for Sally to, to read and also to sell in the store to learn economy and thrift. Um, there are a few like that. Um, there's some many notes in the Philadelphia, in the uh, American Philosophical Society of ledger, the original ledger books, uh, notes there uh, about finance and efforts on her part. But really, finally getting, and then you have some comments from people who knew her. Um, some of them may be doubtful, but um, some of them, uh, there's, a, there's a thread that runs through. There's relatives who complain about her um, to Ben, some letters uh, that he, he kind of ignores or throws off. Um, but ultimately, it's her, her voice um, that you begin to see. And I was so glad, finally, to, to have that. Um, but yes, it, it takes, it takes um, some scratching. I was fortunate, though. The uh, Franklin Papers, of course, is a very long-term project. Uh, that has been at Yale University uh, in combination or in cooperation with the American Philosophical Society. Uh, but um, those are uh, bound volumes. They're still being, they're still in progress. There's more transcription of volumes to come. Um, but in 2006, the Library of Congress began to digitize the Franklin Papers. And um, so that was a tremendous relief, let me put it to you that way, um, that I could, and you can sort through them and find their letters to each other. It still takes a while, but um, it is, it's a great relief to have some of that. So I was grateful for that when I, when I got it. <laughs> yeah, that makes a big difference. Yes, we have yeah. questions beginning to come in from members of our audience. Debbie, okay. Schaefer, J Debbie Schaefer Jacobs asks, did he regret the time he lost with Deborah and his daughter as a child? What if, and what about his correspondence with his sister, Jane? Of course, uh, Jill Lepore has written about his sister, Jane. Right, right. Yes. Um, how much he regretted, uh, well, he certainly regretted that he wasn't with Sally when she was uh, being courted by Richard Beige, um, because he, he had kept inviting her to come to England to get him away from Richard Beige. So clearly he wishes he had been with her then. And, um, and, and then, you know, afterwards, it really, throughout his life with her, he's, he's, he's always lecturing about thrift and he knows that Richard Beige is based, they're going to basically live off of, uh, of his wealth, which is something he wanted to avoid. So there's that issue. Um, and um, did he regret being with Deborah? I don't know. He, I guess he did um, because his letters to Deborah are affectionate uh, most of the time. Although sometimes he lectures her, he gets angry with her on various issues. Um, but I, did he, how, how deep would, did that go? I don't know. Look, this is a man whose primary goal was, was um, the betterment of human beings, the betterment of what would become America finally. And this is what he fought for. He wanted, he wanted to, to, to improve humanity. That was his goal, uh, his, his burning desire in life. So, you know, he's, he's focused on that. I think the women, um, He's a man, he's a human being. I think the women were, were uh, secondary to him. And uh, not that he, not that he, and he certainly needed them. We certainly see plenty of that in, in the letters that he has with um, the French women, for instance, um, and things that he depends on Deborah for. But I, I think that, I don't think that he was filled with regret for not seeing Deborah, except perhaps in the end. The last year of life when she is not writing to him anymore, she's had a stroke and probably suffering from another one. She isn't writing to him and suddenly he's writing to her, which he didn't do so, so often. He's suddenly writing to her. Are you angry with me? Are you angry because I didn't come home when I said I would? And why haven't I heard from you? And now it's been nine months and, and letters like that. So he's concerned, um, but he has another, another overweening goal. Let me put it that way, or passion, if you will. Mm -hmm. And from our perspective in the 21st century, this story could have other, other kinds of undertones. I mean, Marsha Schmidt and Quentin Blaine ask, uh, the notion of sexual harassment came into our minds when you talked about the way he scared a woman into fleeing. Will you speak a bit more about that? Yeah, I'm glad somebody picked up on that because I wondered as I was writing this and discovering what had been written. I mean, it's pretty, uh, pretty damning. 
um, what Turgot wrote about uh, that, you know, it was practically violent. So, you know, you do have to wonder, but I don't know. I mean, she was, uh, Madame Lovicious was, you know, very firm, uh, <laughs> flitting around, but very firm about her independence. Um, and uh, some funny comments about that, where he would have to kiss her hand. She was like a sultan that he would have to kiss her hand and beg forgiveness, and then she'd wave him off. So, I mean, this, many historians have said, oh, they were just, it was flirtatious and it was playful. And many historians have said that about all of those, those comments with the French women, but I don't think so. Not, not from what I read. I think it's, it's more serious. Yes, he's clever about it. Yes, they're clever with each other. They have to be. This is what the rules were uh, in French society. But I think it was for real. Yeah. Um, Julia Watson says, she writes that this is a fascinating compressed talk about a complex figure. I, and she writes, I appreciated your incorporation of various letters. I appreciated your fleshing out a of a portrait of Deborah Reed as a complex and capable woman. From the autobiography, it's difficult to discern whether Ben, as, a, as the man of passion and or compassion in the age of reason, is a self-serving persona in a narrative clearly written by a, quote, sly fox, but you refer to his private neediness and perhaps suffering as well. Would you expand a bit more? Well, I do agree that he's certainly been written about as a sly fox, and he is, and, you know, it's fascinating in his autobiography, everything he writes including the birth of William, his, his uh, out of wedlock son, it's glossed over. There's a lot of mystery there. Um, but, you know, is that unusual for today? Um, I, I don't think it is. Um, I think that's the way people are. People aren't going to, you know, air their dirty laundry in public, so to speak. So, you know, I think, I think that, that um, there, that's to be expected in a way. Um, but it is very frustrating. And Historians have, you know, many historians have said, uh, you know, how clever he is and, and how sly he is. And I agree, it's hard to get to the essence of the man. Um, goodness, 101,000 books that have been, according to World Catalog, that have been published on him, and we still don't know him that well. Not completely. Not completely. And and thinking about his writings, I, I remember the autobiography well, I taught it for years. You also work with his own his own earlier writings, which he published in his newspapers and elsewhere on marriage and sexuality and the relationships between men and women, you know, and use excerpts from the almanacs and those other writings. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you have a sense that those writings, in, in fact, tell us much about his own views of his own rom romantic or marriage relationships? Oh, absolutely. Go ahead. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, I, ju I just wonder how much of that is his own views and how much of that is kind of standard standard tropes for the day that he puts into, into his almanacs. Well, all, poor Richard's almanac, of course, has Richard Saunders, who's sort of the victim of this shrewish, shrewish wife, and yet he's a character of his own. He's kind of a near-do-well, and he has these rattling trap inventions. And, you know, he, his wife gets, when they finally, the almanac sells, you know, she gets new coats and new clothes and things. And he gets a secondhand coat and he's so proud of it. So <laughs> I think that's, you know, and his almanac is filled with a contradiction on, on women. There are lots of times, the many, many, many phrases in there about the, you know, the most important thing for a man was, was having a great wife and great health. This was rich. This was riches. Uh, there were those. Um, a little wife and, and so on. But then there are others in which, you know, he, they're quite misogynist. You know, a man, the man, last thing a man dies in a man is, is his mind or his heart. And the last thing that dies in a woman is her mouth. I mean, so, yeah. so, or her tongue. So you have these, they're popular, they're funny, um, but he really runs the gamut. Um, and I think he was ambivalent about women. I do. Yeah. It does seem that way, yeah. Uh, we have several questions here about the relationship between Franklin's daughter, Sally, and Mrs. Stevenson's daughter, Polly. Uh, Elizabeth Cahill asks, do we know anything about what Sally thought of Polly or what Polly thought of Sally? And 
Lorna Pezzanelli asks, can you speak more about the differences in the relationships he had with Polly and his own daughter, Sally? These really are parallel figures in his life, but he seems to treat them very differently. And, and in the end, they, they get to know each other. What, what do you know about their relationship? I wish I knew more, but I, and I don't know how much Sally knew about what was going on with Polly, although he does talk about how she just got married. And when, when Sally is uh, thinking about marrying, he says, well, Polly did a good thing. She got rid of this very poor suitor. And yeah, this, this, he's always lecturing Sally. And, you know, much later when, when, uh, and I don't get into it in the book because I wasn't, I didn't have the space or the time uh, when, when Sally goes on a campaign to have the ladies of Philadelphia get organized and, and create sew shirts for the soldiers, the American patriots. um, And she's doing all this. And then she finally gets invited to a dance with George Washington and he doesn't want to send her feathers and, and things frills for her dress is ridiculous. She should dress very plainly. Yet we do know, for instance, and again, I don't dwell on this because it wasn't quite the thrust of my book. Uh, we do know that he did, in, he did um, uh, get involved in some kind of a lottery to get Polly diamond earrings. Um, he gave her away. And then you have the competition with the two grand sets of grandchildren where it compared uh, well, this one did that, and this one did that, and it's um, you know pretty hurtful. It's mostly for Deborah. Deborah is so proud of young Benji, for instance. She calls him her kingbird, and she's always bragging about him. And he he says things like, "Well, it's your grandson, you know, your grandson. It's not her grandson. It's their grandson." And yet he's all enamored of, of Polly's children. So it's quite hurtful. Now at the end, when Paul, when when Polly comes over. I mean, I've looked and looked and I wish I had more. I wish I had more, but we do know from some reports, they were polite to each other. Uh, there does not seem to have been a lot of warmth. They were polite and uh, correct with each other, but obviously, I mean, they had to have, it, it had to be uncomfortable for both of them. I mean, they both love Ben and- mm -hmm. Yeah, and you know, it's one's his biological child, and one is, and he he even comments about that that it you know biology mattered less than relationships. Yeah, and and in his case, he spent the better part of three decades in in London and Paris, far away from his wife, and closer to Polly, and closer to Mrs. Stevenson, and so on. So it's just a reminder that the, we think of Benjamin Franklin as this quintessential American, but in so many ways, he was as European a character as, as there was during this period. Um, I wanna close up with one more question. Um, before tonight's program, you mentioned to me that this book was more than 20 years in the making. So, yes. so you know, as you were working on this book, you were publishing other books on 18th century women. So how have your ideas about this book and this material and the people in it changed over time, especially as you've done other research on, on 18th century women's lives. Yes, um, well, I should say, I began this book 26 years ago about Deborah Reed. And you know, it's, that's a very large topic. This was pre-computer where we are with internet and access and anything like digitization as a daunting task. But uh, nobody was really interested in Deborah Reed. I mean, we still had the, the traditional historian view this stupid, dumpy woman, shrill, who, you know, we don't, too bad he got married her so young, you know, that's, that's the view and nobody cared about her. Um, so try to answer your question. I'm um, going through, I put that book aside three times, put it in the back file. I took it out, took it out, you know, repeatedly and it just wasn't going to work. And then uh, as time has gone on, and I guess as also as I've learned more about colonial women, um, you know, it's like, it kept bothering me. This, this gotta be, I need this mystery solved. Um, so I think it informed me, uh, the other, what I learned about colonial women, uh, and you know, that we don't have that much information. Um, the women who wrote were largely at least middle-class and educated. There aren't that many in the 18th century that you have that kind of information from scraps, but not enough, not a, not a full enough oeuvre that you, you could fashion a book around. So uh, yes, I had that with the other two books that were mentioned earlier, but um, finding this, you know, was, was terrific. And then of course, uh, the French women. And I have to say that an earlier historian, Claudian Lopez, <clears throat> excuse me, 
<clears throat> had written uh, about them in several of their books. Um, and she was a transcriber of, of some of the Franklin papers, so she knew a great deal. And that was a help also. But, um, you know, times have moved on even since then. Uh, we're in a different age, a post-Me Too, a uh, third wave of feminism, um, and a lot more respect, I think, in, <laughs> I think respect, I hope, um, for women and understanding they're really an important part of history that has been marginalized. Absolutely so. And, and I'm delighted that, that you were able to spend an hour with us tonight talking about this fascinating story and about Deborah Reed Franklin and the other women in Benjamin Franklin's life. Our hour is drawing to a close. I'd like to thank you, Nancy Rubin Stewart, for a really stimulating conversation. Um, and, and thanks to everybody who's been watching this evening. If you'd like to recommend this program to friends, our public programs are available on the AAS YouTube channel, and this one will be there in the coming days. We have a number of programs coming up in the next month, including two more in our Women Make History series, both the week of April 4th. On Tuesday, April 5th, Thavolia Glimpf will be here to discuss her book, The Women's Fight, The Civil War's Battles for Home, Freedom, and Nation. And two nights later, on Thursday, April 7th, Taya Miles will talk about all that she carried, the journey of Ashley's sack, a Black family keepsake. So check out these programs and many more at our website, AmericanAntiquarian.org. And you can watch previous programs on our YouTube channel. Thank you so much, Nancy. Thank you. It's been really an honor and a privilege to be here. Thank you all. Thank you all and have a good evening.